Welcome to everybody watching here from the Swiss Alps in Zermatt, where I'm looking out of the window and I think it's snowing, uh, which is kind of unusual for September, but uh, we have some African sun with us today. <laughs> We're very fortunate to have uh, Chido Guevara, who's just given a wonderful presentation at the summit this morning. Uh, Chido, I'd, I'd like to, first of all, thank you, obviously, for your presentation. Uh, could you just present yourself a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about your, your background, your childhood? That'd be great. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Chido Guevara from Zimbabwe. Uh, I grew up in a village called Marange, actually not very far away from the diamond fields uh, in Zimbabwe. And um, I become, became an orphan at the age of uh, seven. And from that early age, I had to learn to take care of my family, which comprised of uh, my grandmother and uh, a younger brother, who was two years younger than me then. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's when I had to learn to work to put food on the table and I had to do different kinds of uh, work which uh, uh, ranged from digging in other people's fields in the gardens, fetching water, fetching firewood and tending to children sometimes. And so, yeah, I had uh, that kind of a start and then um, uh, by the time I was uh, nine years old, I was out of school. Uh, when I was 10 years old, they were already offering to get me married off so I can have a husband who will then provide for me. And um, uh, luckily, I was not so keen on those things because I had really uh, assumed the responsibility of taking care of my grandmother and my younger brother. And I could not bear the thought of getting married and leaving them alone uh, just so I can have food. And uh, the question was always, well, if I go, what happens to them? And when I refused to get married, the person who was organizing it came to me and said, well, Chido, you turned down the only help that we can give you. Mm. So from now on, you are on your own. You have to find a way of uh, making it work. So I can imagine in Zimbabwe, it was a really unusual choice that you, that you um, made. Of course. I mean, because at that age and in those circumstances, you're not, not even capable of making any choices. Mm. You you do what has to be done. And then at that moment, getting married seemed like the only thing that was uh, my saving grace. And um, but uh, but of course, for me, it was difficult because I had to choose between these people. But when you get married, you leave the family, you leave your family to go and stay with another and and uh, thank God for that. I chose to stay and take care of the pe the two people that I was taking care of. But then your life changed. And then, of course, uh, when I was 11, I was introduced to mushroom farming thanks to uh, Zeri Foundation and uh, uh, my father, <laughs> uh, Gunter Pauli. Gunter Pauli right. And um, uh, they were working with uh, scientists from around the world, introducing the art of cultivating mushrooms. And um, as part of that project, they actually invited 15 young girl orphans to attend a training session mm -hmm. of which I was a part of. And I, I still remember that clearly. I went to the training barefoot and with all wow. my clothes in a small bag. And um, they often tell stories of how when they would put food on the table, I would grab as much as I could <laughs> because it was just it, it was a different time for me. But um, what was really an important uh, uh, um, um, outcome of that is that when I went back to my village being able to grow mushrooms, I looked around and I thought to myself, well, if I can convert waste from this little field that belonged to my grandmother, but which I was in charge of, and every end of farming season, I had only corn stalks or millet stalks, but really no food. And realizing then that I could convert all that waste into food in the form of mushrooms was for me an important turning point because to go back when I was eight years old, I had already experienced enough things that I told myself that when I, if I survive, when I am older, I like to be able to help other young girls so they don't have to go through the things that I went through. Right, because your presentation was called Orphans Teach Orphans. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And this is really something that, 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 uh, that, that I started feeling very strongly about since I was eight years old. Because I had seen a lot of things that made me feel like 
nobody should have to go through this especially the girls because yes when when you find yourself in in, in the circumstances like I was boys suffer also but for girls it's a different story altogether because you not only suffer from the pain inflicted on you by the bad people around you but you also have to sort of swallow everything in and and be the strong one because you know I was only able-bodied one who had to work to fend for the family so I really had to find a way of ignoring all the pain and trying to keep strong so I can help the two people who depended on me to survive. And in your presentation you made this point that there's also this issue of access to land. There, 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 there are many issues. So in, in my case I was lucky because my grandmother owned a piece of land so I could work on that land but the homestead did not belong to what well, it was for my grandmother but her son was in charge of that homestead and oftentimes i would get threats like if the people did something to me so if they touched me inappropriately and i want to report it was always a threat if you say this to anyone we send you out of the homestead wow. and and it was really f a very big thing in my life because I was also on my mother's side of the family, that when I went for my first training, when they asked me what I wished for, I wished to have a father. So before even realizing all the possibilities of the mushrooms, for me it was so important to have a father because your father, the homestead that belongs to your father, is a place where you are the safest. Mm. Because then you don't have this threat of you can stay here, you can't stay here. And you, you always have to play nice, especially as a girl. You always have to play nice so you can have a space. And so, um, but oftentimes women and, and especially orphans do not have access to land. And I think the, the possibility that I, that, that I could see with the mushrooms is that this was, first of all, in a controlled environment where in a small space like a 16 square meter, or even we have uh, now groups of women around Zimbabwe, some of them, they only have one and a half by one and a half meter. And they and, call them indoors, yes? They are the mentors, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're indoors. They're in indoors. They, 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 yeah. It's, it's inside a small room of mm. one and a half meter by one and a half meter. They go in there and they can grow mushrooms, enough for them to eat, but also enough for them to sell and earn a little bit of money. And so that for me was very, very um, important to actually uh, find now the means with which I can reach the other orphans that I had in t wished to do when I was eight. And um, in a small house that, that, that we use for the production of mushrooms, it was actually 16 square meters when I started. Mm -hmm. It was built out of wood and plastics and grass. And um, from there we sold the mushrooms and I was able to get some money with which I could buy corn and other things that I could not grow myself. But uh, part of the money that we raised was used to actually send other young orphans to school. And of course, you would think that the normal thing is now you have money, you immediately decide that, well, I want to be one of the orphans that go to school. But for me, it was completely different. I thought, I want to do more of this and be able to send more people to school. So what did I do? So a lot of people went to school, but from the 15 girls, you have to understand also that in this marriage is also a very big thing for a girl who has not been to school, they don't have a job and everything. When we came back in my community farming mushrooms, we became very popular mm. because and, 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 uh, uh, no, nobody had heard about it before, nobody had seen it anywhere before and we were doing it and suddenly all the boys that di didn't look at us before, the boys who have castle to pay the bride price when they marry, suddenly they noticed us and for a lot of the for a lot of the girls that was really attractive to say well finally i can get to marry into the right family within the context of the village of course and a lot of them got married i mean in less than six months 13 girls got married six months in oh, less wow. than 16 months 13 wow. of the 15 girls got married but of course i was lucky enough because i'd escaped already a marriage proposal when i was 10 and and for me it meant a whole new world to actually be able to earn an income from converting waste into food not just any food but uh, nutritious food which is also tasty because sometimes y you think well yeah this is nutritious but you don't like to eat it but with mushrooms it was a you combination you of the many things best <laughs> of course we, we we make now the best sure, mushrooms yeah. of the world that's true <laughs> But also what was nice is that uh, my grandmother, who was already over 100 years old, 
before I learned about mushrooms, she'd taken me into the bushes and I ran around collecting different types of mushrooms, putting them in front of her. And she knew so well about mushrooms right, that just by, knowledge, break, yeah. by smelling them, she yeah. could tell me this was a poisonous mushroom, this was a non-poisonous mushroom, this was edible, this was not. Mm. So I think I also had the advantage of having a grandmother who loved mushrooms, that this really presented uh, easy access to something that she grew up with, because we depended on mushrooms for relish, uh, uh, for as a source of protein, that uh, it was a, a common source of food. And so the combination of my grandmother, who had such knowledge uh, on mushrooms, and that we actually had a culture of eating mushrooms, made it even more interesting. And for my grandmother, it was also easy for her to encourage me because then it was um, speaking to something that she also enjoyed, not only the issue of being able to help other orphans and, and getting other food. So I thought to myself, no, I'm not getting married. I'm going to work and I understand more about mushroom farming so I can really share this with the people who need it. And in my opinion, at that time, the people who needed it were the young girls like myself who ha often have to be married off so they can have some food or they have to do different kinds of jobs. Some of them you do not really expect children to be doing that, but for because they have nothing else, they have to do it. And so I started looking into how do I make the process easy enough. So eliminating all the sort of so some of the chemical processes for cleaning the waste material before using it to grow mushrooms and really making it into something very basic. Uh, and like I mentioned in my presentation earlier, um, in terms of the growing unit, the, the house that is used to grow the mushrooms, we just, you know, we made a, a copy of what my grandmother could build for us to stay. And we made exactly that and just clean it a little bit better and that we can use as a mushroom house. And that made it so easy for people to relate to, for people to actually um, accept it because it works within the context where they live and w materials that, th that they have all the time. I mean, the only thing which is in abundance in most of the communities where people don't have food is waste. Sure, but I think what's fascinating also is you've taken this also to lots of other countries, not just in Africa, you're taking it to France, I think, as well. We've taken it to many, many places more than France. We've brought mushroom farming to Mongolia. Um, we've brought mushroom farming to the US, uh, working not only with the poor girls, who, like I originally thought this is who I wanted to help, but we've shared this with entrepreneurs around the world and who are doing this, not necessarily because they don't have an, a, any other option, but it's turned out to be an innovation that really can help addressing issues of job uh, job uh, employment and, and 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 really food production within uh, the city which is something that uh, um, we need to actually do well, more and course, more city, especially with the size of cities today. of course yeah, yeah. I mean, a question which I've been sort of passed to, <laughs> pass on to you is I mean, how, how many people do you think that the the earth can actually feed I mean, is there a limit to it I, because I know, I think you're an optimistic person. <laughs> you don't say, you know, we have to cut down world population or things like that. I, I, I'm, I think we need more people to get into food production. Right. We, have, we have the resources. We have the space. If we're thinking about it in a creative enough a way, we can feed all the people. Mm. But I think we've built a dependency on someone else taking care of our food production and someone else who's doing that simply because they're thinking of the business side of things. And again, because they're only thinking about food production in, in the sense of how much money they can make, then we have really depleted the soil and we've uh, put in place unsustainable means of production. But I think when we go back to um, what it used to be back in the day, every household is taking care of food production and we take care not to deplete the soil. I remember when I was harvesting mushrooms with my grandmother, she would tell me, when you see a mushroom that's too old for you to eat, do not move it from where it is, leave it there. And when you're harvesting a mushroom that you like, cut and leave a piece of the mushroom in the ground so that the gods can give you more mushrooms next year. And of course, when you think about it, she, she referred to the gods, but this is really about maintaining the seed of the, the, the yeah. culture of the mushroom there. Yeah. And we have come in with new ways of producing food that wipes all of that out. And, and it, when we can change this, 
we actually have, and with, with the new innovations we have, we have all it takes to actually feed the people. So you're hopeful? I, I am very hopeful. That's really wonderful. <laughs> so thank you very much, Judy Gouverneur. Thank you.